New merchandise available on JG9Shop.com. Now available on the store, we have JG9 flip-flops, JG9 crop hoodies, JG9 grip rings, and JG9 notebooks. In addition to the over 100 products already available on the store. Get yours today and kick off this summer JG9 style. And now, on with our feature presentation. The year is 1982. The New England Patriots need a ton of help, and that's putting it mildly. They were atrocious in 1981, going 2-14, finishing with a worst record in football, and finishing with their worst record in the over two decade long history of the franchise at this point. And one of the reasons why they were so bad was because outside of Stanley Morgan, arguably the greatest receiver in franchise history, they had no one to throw the ball to. Their second best pure wide receiver was a 35 year old Harold Jackson, and he didn't even score a single touchdown that year and would be on the Minnesota Vikings in 1982. The Pats needed help badly. If they were going to bounce back, then they needed to get some weapons to throw to, whether it was Steve Grogan or Matt Cavanaugh throwing the football. And fortunately for them, they got what seemed like a gift from the heavens when they were able to acquire this man right here from the Atlanta Falcons. Because in 1982, the Patriots acquired coveted wide receiver Wallace Francis. Except they didn't get him. Because the entire Wallace Francis saga of the 1982 offseason was so bizarre and featured a guy who seemingly had no idea what he wanted and changed his mind more times than the average human blinks in a day. This is the story behind the bizarre transaction, the crazy ending to a good receiver's career, and what might be the strangest waiver claim pickup in the over 60 year history of the New England Patriots franchise. Before I talk about the actual waiver claim in question, we need some context to understand just who Wallace Francis is, how good he was prior to this bizarre series of events, and why he wanted to leave his original team, the Atlanta Falcons, in the first place. Francis originally got his start in the NFL in 1973, after being drafted by the Buffalo Bills in the fifth round of the NFL Draft out of Arkansas Pine Bluff. The good news for Francis was that he was a great kick returner. In 1973, he led the NFL with two kickoff returns for a touchdown, and led the NFL by averaging 29.9 yards per kick return, and he followed that up in 1974 by finishing second in the league in kickoff return yards, only behind rookie Lou Pacone of the New York Jets. The bad news for Francis was that he wasn't exactly playing at wide receiver, as he didn't record a single catch. When he got traded to the Atlanta Falcons during the 1975 offseason in exchange for two draft picks, that was about to change. Because in the seven years that Francis spent with the Falcons, he established himself as one of the top offensive weapons in the short history of the team. In 1978, the Falcons made it to the playoffs for the first time in franchise history, and the play of Francis was a big reason why, as he finished the season with 45 receptions for 695 yards and three touchdowns. All three of those totals led the team, as he was Steve Barkowski's favorite target to throw to. And when most Falcons fans think of Wallace Francis, odds are, the first play that they think of comes from that 1978 season in the playoffs during the wildcard round against the Philadelphia Eagles. Because when the lights were on him brightest, he shone, and made the biggest play in Falcons history at the time. Heck, in the over half century long history of the franchise, many argue that this is the greatest play in franchise history. With less than two minutes to go in the game, and the Falcons trailing 13-7, Barkowski hits Francis for a 37-yard touchdown to give the Falcons the win. Francis could have done nothing else for the rest of his career, and for his performance in that game, where he had six receptions for 135 yards, along with a game-winning touchdown to give the Falcons their first playoff win ever, he would be a team legend. But Francis didn't stop there, because Francis followed that up by continuing to play really well. In 1979, he once again led the team in every major receiving category, but did it by smashing his numbers from 1978. This time, he won the team triple crown with 74 receptions for 1,013 yards and 8 touchdowns, finishing 3rd in the NFL in receptions, 8th in receiving touchdowns, and 9th in receiving yards. If you looked at every receiver in 1979 to have more than 70 receptions, 1,000 yards, and at least 8 touchdowns, the list would consist of two people and two people only, Minnesota Vikings wide receiver Ahmad Rashad and Wallace Francis. As a side note, to learn more about Ahmad Rashad's legendary career in the NFL, click the card in the upper right corner. 
at the time, Francis' 74 receptions were a franchise record for the most in a single season, absolutely obliterating the previous record of 50 held by Art Malone in 1972. His 1,013 yards made him the first receiver in Falcons history to cross the 1,000-yard mark, and his eight receiving touchdowns also set a franchise record for the most in a single season. In other words, whatever the Falcons gave up to the Bills to get Francis was looking like highway robbery at this point. Follow that up with another good season in 1980, where he had 54 receptions for 862 yards and 7 touchdowns, and by the end of 1981, his numbers with the Falcons were 244 receptions for 3,695 yards and 27 touchdowns. By this point, he was second all-time in team history in receptions, only trailing tight end Jim Mitchell. He was third all-time in receiving yards behind Mitchell and Alfred Jenkins, and third all-time in receiving touchdowns behind those two aforementioned people. Wallace Francis was a Falcons legend, and at the time, many people considered him to be the greatest receiver in team history. If he wasn't first, and you gave first place to Alfred Jenkins, at the very least, he was an awfully close second. However, entering the 1982 season, his relationship with his longtime employer was beginning to sour. Francis was frustrated with the Falcons for a few reasons. Number one, the Falcons were coming off of an incredibly disappointing 1981 campaign, where after winning the NFC West for the first time ever the year before, and finishing with the best record in football, they went 7-9 and ended the season on a three-game losing streak. Francis was furious at how the roster was constructed, and was furious at how the roster was constructed in 1979 as well, when they had a losing record a year after making the playoffs. As Francis said, What made me wonder is that after the 1980 season, we turned over so many people so fast. I just thought the foundation to win was built in 1980, and I thought we did a great job of tearing it down. To make the same mistake twice is either ignorance or on purpose. Number two, Francis hated the ownership and felt that the team wasn't focused whatsoever on winning, but rather on making money. And to illustrate this point, he said that he wanted to be traded to a winner, and pointed out four teams that he wanted to be traded to that he believed exemplified this philosophy, citing Oakland, San Francisco, Dallas, and New Orleans. Wait, 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 hold up. I know this isn't the main point of the story, but come on. New Orleans? You wanted to be traded to a winner? And you cited the New Orleans Saints? I'm sorry, what? First off, why the heck would the Falcons trade away a franchise legend to their biggest rival? That's like a player on the Packers saying that he wanted to be traded to the Bears, or a player on the Eagles saying that he wanted to be traded to the Cowboys. The Falcons aren't trading you to their arch nemesis, especially since they think you're a really good player, and you're crazy if you think otherwise. But number two, just because I can't get over this, you listed four teams that were winners, and the New Orleans Saints were one of them? I get Oakland. Al Davis only cares about winning. The Raiders had dominated the past decade, had won two Super Bowls in the last six years, and won the Super Bowl two seasons ago. I get San Francisco, obviously. They just won the Super Bowl, and looked like they had an insanely bright future with Joe Montana and Bill Walsh leading the helm. And I get Dallas. They hadn't had a losing record in the entire Super Bowl era, and had made the playoffs all but one year in that stretch. But New Orleans? The team that has never made the playoffs? The team that has never even had a winning record? The team that was 1-15 two years ago? The team that, since joining the NFL, has won 59 games for an average of less than four games a season? The team that has posted a record of 59-154-5, winning a whopping 27% of the time? The team that in 1981, you guys swept by a combined score of 68-10? That's the team that you said cares about winning, and that is a winner? Are you out of your mind? I'm sorry, I know this is a side tangent completely unrelated to the main point of the story, but I had to bring that up, because that truly might be one of the dumbest trade requests I've ever heard in my life. That's like saying I'm tired of playing cold weather, so I want to be traded to either Miami, Los Angeles, or Chicago. One of these things is not like the other. Anyways. Getting back on track after whatever the heck that was. Number three, Francis was miffed at how he was being treated in terms of his salary. There was a strike that was looming in the distance, and Francis, knowing that the writing was on the wall and that a strike was inevitable, had a demand for the Falcons. If he reported to work, and he wanted to since he didn't want to go on strike, 
he wanted his salary, which was $150,000, to be guaranteed. In other words, he wanted to be paid for showing up to work, like any employee in the world wants. I'm sure you wouldn't go to work if your boss told you that he won't guarantee that you would be paid. And the Falcons said no, with Executive Vice President Eddie LeBaron telling Francis that they weren't going to do that. And that was the last straw. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Francis said on the whole situation, My whole thing is my loyalty to my employer, and my employer is not returning the loyalty. My employer chose not to return my loyalty, and so I choose not to work for them. It's obvious my time with the Falcons has come to an end. We had no idea what the 1982 season was going to look like because of the impending strike, but we knew one thing for sure. Wallace Francis was never donning the Falcon uniform again. The Falcons tried trading him and honoring his request, but after a week, they found no takers, as no one wanted to trade for Francis with his contract demands. And after not finding any takers, the Falcons let him go, and waived him after seven years of service. A great career had come to an end, and head coach Lehman Bennett was disappointed that it ended on such a sour note, saying, I certainly hate that it comes to a situation where we have to release him. He had been very productive. I'm sorry it had to come to a close like this. Now, Francis had to find a new home, as he was put on waivers. And one of the teams that was interested in him was the New England Patriots. They tried to make a trade for him, but were unable to do so. The Pats apparently wanted to do a one-for-one -one player swap, and the Falcons were not interested in the player that the Pats were offering. For some reason, the name of that player was never disclosed, so this remains a mystery. However, the Pats wanted him to bolster their receiving unit for the reasons mentioned at the top of the video, and they had high priority in the waiver order. New Orleans and Washington were ahead of the Pats, but neither team put in a claim. And when Francis fell to the number three spot on the waiver wire, the Pats swooped him up. They had their receiver to play alongside Stanley Morgan. They had the number two receiver that they'd been looking for. It was a return to the AFC East for Francis, and was a brand new chapter in the football player's life. Now, all the Pats had to do was contact him and get him going. And this is where things, if they weren't weird already, get truly bizarre. Because what follows is one of the strangest results to a team putting in a waiver claim that you're ever going to see. In a normal world, when a team claims a player off of waivers, the team then proceeds to contact the player to let them know that they've been picked up. But this is not a normal world, as you could probably tell by the title of this video. After the Patriots claimed Francis, at first, they couldn't get in contact with him, and they had no idea as to where he was. For days, they tried to get in touch with the receiver, and for days, he wasn't answering their calls or wasn't getting any of the notifications. Turns out, immediately after getting weighed by the Falcons, he went on a religious retreat in South Carolina. The only person who seemed to know about this was his wife Cheryl, who said on the whole incident, I really can't say what he's going to do. So now, we have a player who the Patriots are counting on to be their starting receiver, and he's gone away on a religious retreat, with no contact with the Patriots or the NFL on his whereabouts. Finally, he returned upon the conclusion of his retreat, and found out about the news that he was claimed by the Patriots. And Francis was excited about the news. No, they weren't his first choice by any means, but his impression of the Pats was a good one. As Francis said, From what I've learned, I like the team. I know they need some help at wide receiver, since they've only got Stanley Morgan out there. That's why I felt it would be good for me and the team. I could aid Stanley and take some of the double teaming off of him. So you would think that the natural conclusion to this story is that despite the weird mix-up at the start, and despite not knowing about the news for a few days and leaving everyone in the dark, that he would join the Patriots, and everything would be okay. Well, not quite. Because one day after saying that quote, guess what Francis decided to do? Turns out, he was so inspired by that religious retreat that he decided to retire and join the ministry. Yep, not even 24 hours after saying how excited he was to be joining the Patriots, he said that he was joining a new team, and was joining the church. And if you think I'm trying to make a joke about him joining a new team, I am literally not. Francis himself flat out said on his decision, My desire is to play for the Lord. In fairness to Francis, 
It's not as though this came completely out of nowhere. He was on the record before all this happened and said that when he retired, whenever that was, his post-football career was going to be in the ministry. But I guess this retreat expedited the process just a little bit. The Pats thought they had a gift dropped from the sky in getting Francis and not having to give up anything. But life had other ideas. Head coach Ron Meyer, who definitely was not bitter about the incident at all, as you'll be able to tell from these quotes, said on Francis, he just felt that he has more important things than football. He felt that he was touched religiously. Not having him is not something that's earth-shattering to us at all. He's a 31-year-old receiver who three years ago caught 70 passes, two years ago caught 50 passes, and last year caught 30 passes. At that progression, he'd catch 10 passes this season. So, by that absolutely awful advanced analytic logic, would Francis catch negative 10 passes if he stayed around in 1983? How does one even catch negative 10 passes? Anyways, Meyer was basically saying, Go ahead! Retire! We don't need you anyway! We didn't even want you in the first place! Which is definitely something that a not bitter person would say. But regardless, Wallace Francis was not a patriot. He would never play in the NFL again. And today, Francis is still in the ministry, and serves as the National Director for Ambassadors for Christ International USA. So he's been in the ministry for 40 years at this point. He found his calling after his playing career ended, so good for him for sure. That being said, even though it worked out for Francis in the end, and he obviously has no regrets about it, it doesn't make this entire situation any less bizarre. Just to recap, the Falcons cut Wallace Francis, the Patriots pick him up, the Patriots are then unable to contact him because he's at some religious retreat. Francis returns from the retreat, hears the news, and decides that he was so inspired after the retreat that he's never going to play football again. The Patriots are going to make a ton of waiver claims over the rest of their franchise's history, but I highly doubt that any of them are going to be as weird and as bizarre as this one right here. Because this whole saga left a ton of Pats fans at the time thinking one thing, and one thing only. Oh my god. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.